So good morning, um, another um, week with Coffee with the Artists. And this morning we're going to be talking with uh, Teresa Brown in North Carolina, um, or Sophia. And so um, we'll just roll with it and see how it goes and um, listen closely if Teresa doesn't get her sound issue worked out. Um, Teresa, maybe we can kind of start. I know you and I <clears throat> have known each other since when I lived in Saxapaha. And so I know you and Steve have a really long history in the arts. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your creative journey. Okay. Um, you can interpret if some, and I will talk slower. Basically going to some point shut that off. Okay, at some point, my husband will probably uh, hook me up to the iPad instead of the computer. We're having trouble finding the headphones, which we have not had to use um, until now. But um, yeah, I actually have been in the art world, oh gosh, as a living for over 30 years. And I was in commercial art at East Carolina University with a minor in printmaking. So, I think most of us who are creative today have been in it in various fields for a long time. So portraits are what provided uh, a name, and they, they still they still do. Um, but I've always used whatever art form I do to make a living at it. So it's not for the faint of heart. Let me put it that way. But uh, there was a period where I was a single mom with four kids, and uh, the portrait supported us um, not always well, but good enough. So uh, the fiber journey started probably about 12 years ago, and I got into the silk painting part, which was part of the painting. And so yeah, that's where I first got into spin, because that was the go-to Okay. Place. Hang on one second. What? At some point, we'll switch over to the iPad, which I hope is everyone still hearing me more or less. It's still pretty awful. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> okay. Well, there was a link. Hang on a second, guys. Please be patient. I'm so sorry. What's the meeting ID, Suzanne? Pardon me? What's your meeting ID? I'm signing with the iPad. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I know. It's the same thing. Can, can you go to the, um, where's my email? There's a link right there. Do you want the meeting I ID? I have it if you'd like it. I have it. It's um, 817-7901-8076. Good going, guys. You want the Eight. password? Do you need no, that? Wait, wait. Wait, no, we got 817-7901-8076. 8076-8076. Password? Oh, what's the password? 321363. 321363. Yeah, it could be your phone speaker too. Could be that I, when I drop my computer, I... The computer sound sucks. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Steve. <laughs> you, you heard that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, he was very clear, too. <laughs> That's because the only thing you do when you're talking to him, but if you say something on the side, <laughs> there's no problem picking it up. Okay, I'm letting you back in, Teresa, so here you come. 
Okay, so. That's a little better. Unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay. Hey, that's good. Is that better? That is much better. So see, it was your phone. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So good morning. Now we've been off to a rough start, but we're getting going. Um, so Teresa, maybe you could start over and telling us all about your creative journey. Creative. Wait a minute, which oh. one am I looking at? <laughs> <laughs> Gee whiz, where am I? You know, at this rate, I'm going to hold the damn thing. I'm getting really annoyed with this. Okay. Hang on, guys. I got my little setup behind me over there. That's what it is. So I'm trying to get it so you don't see all the crap that's in the studio. Excuse me, but that's. Oh, no, we don't so... care what you're. Oh, that's is. the fun like, part. That's <laughs> the fun part. That you is. No, when you go when you go online, there's one little area that you have to keep like totally clean. Let me see. Let me move it over here. Let me move it over here. I, mean, I have had yeah. I have go. had the luxury. And now you're not even showing up. So you're what? I yeah. see her. Uh, okay. Susan, do you know how to spotlight her so she shows big when she speaks? Yeah, she's a, the, she is. I do have her spotlighted, but. I see the whole. Okay, maybe it's me. Sorry, it's me. There <laughs> she is. It's me. Got it. Can you okay, see me? There, now we can. Yes. There you go. All right. I'm not moving. I swear to God. I'm Don't sitting. Don't move. And look at, we can see all your stuff behind you and you were good to go. Oh, okay, okay. I'm just sort of like moving. Oops, I guess. It's sort of the opposite of where you're supposed to move. It's very disconcerting. So, okay, well, I'm delighted to see everyone. I just want to double check, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right, okay. It, it must have been my computers. My husband said the audio sucks. What can I say? <laughs> it's just, but it is. So, yeah, I have been in the art industry for many years. I went to East Carolina University. I know this is the boring stuff, but the fun part is that I was in um, printmaking. It was my minor. So when I work on my fiber, a lot of the skills that I learned there, I transfer. Um, it's one reason I knew that pressure was important. It's one reason that I knew that, um, like I carve my own blocks and I print on a lot of my fabric. So, but I have to tell you in college, I was in commercial art, the print, not the printmaking people, they were fine. The fiber people were nuts. They really were. So when it came to that time period, I was sort of like, oh, they're just nuts. And of course, you know, this is like the late seventies. Everyone's back to mother earth and everything. Anybody remember the mother earth news? It was such, the original, it was such a great magazine. I do. So yeah, I had dairy goats. I had, um, I was licensed in North Carolina for cheese making. And during all that time, I was a portrait artist. Um, and people would see the portraits and they'd say, oh, why aren't you doing that instead of what I was doing? My ex-husband and I had a dog kennel and we did uh, boarding. It is a money maker, but you're definitely tied down. But um, so I think most of our creative journeys for all of us have been very varied. It's kind of the way I look at it. I think we all have been able to um, uh, embrace things, not embrace things. I love to mess with all art forms, but I have to tell you what I liked about certain aspects. I really was drawn to the eco printing and shades of that, but I combine a lot of things uh, with it but I found that um, uh, I am competitive and I found that every art form that I did, the portraits turned out to be as out of, excuse me, out of necessity. I found myself a single mom, four kids. I packed up my portraits, my tools, and I went down to the 
local, um, it was like a farmer's market, flea market type thing. This is back in 91 and um, that's all she wrote. I mean, it wasn't always a great living, but it did pay the bills. And I was sort of delighted to be using my skills in some art form. So uh, I can honestly tell you, even though I have alpacas, I never really got into, um, I love the weave, but I never got into things like knitting and crocheting. I honestly, uh, well, I do have a clue, but I, I just don't do it. So I am in awe of people when I go to fiber shows and art shows who um, can use the spinning wheels, can use, heck, I couldn't even use a drop spindle, I tried. So there's obviously a real art form to that. So I don't know uh, exactly where else, I think biographies in a general rule are kind of boring. So I don't really know. Uh, I may just leave it up to people to ask me some questions and that would lead to different uh, discussions. So I am, what do you think, Suzanne? Can people ask us well, something? Well, I am going to keep asking you some questions and I would like to know if you were not an artist, what would you be? Oh my gosh. Um, do you remember those tests they would give you in school when you were little and they would say, and you checked them off as to what your interests were. And at the end, they told you what you were gonna be. And apparently I was going to be a cowgirl. So I thought, well, my interest in horses and music and art. So um, that's a great question. I find that I am an artist who is motivated by two things. One is um, just when the urge hits me, but I am a deadline artist. I need deadlines. And I know when it comes to portraits, I have people say, oh, I don't wanna rush you. I love that. You know how they really worry about the mentality of this crazy artist? Well, I tell them, oh, please give me a deadline. I need a deadline. You know, if you have a deadline, it'll get done. So that's why I love the art shows. Um, uh, you know, I, I love coming to your place to teach because it gives me that winter break, which we all miss this year. Um, even though I've got, we rescheduled to May, it's not quite like leaving North Carolina in. Uh, February and he right. <laughs> heading down to Florida. So, so um, I guess I'm trying to figure out, I, I guess I met you maybe 10 years ago. Um, when I think so, at the gallery. At, at the, the gallery, Steve, yeah. I was representing your husband, Steve, in my art gallery. And yeah. I met you and you came and did a little talk to our artist group about the business of doing art. Oh, yeah. Um, how to make yeah. a living as an artist. Right. So what is the most valuable tip you can give an aspiring maker who is starting a creative business? Um, I actually get asked that a lot. Um, in the marketing seminars that I gave, and you were privy to one of them, most artists are looking for what I call the silver bullet or the magic bullet. They're looking for the one thing that will attract customers to them. And I have to tell them, you as an artist are the whole package. You are selling yourself, what you do. And I think it's more obvious when you ask an artist in any, any medium, have you seen art that you just absolutely did not like and yet the artist is successful? And everyone, somebody comes to mind. Everybody says, yeah, 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 well, I know so-and-so, it's awful work. And the next thing I hear is, if I had to do that, I just wouldn't be an artist. And then I have to remind everyone that you need to be true to yourself, but at the same token, you've got to be smart. You know, I had a lot of artists that just um, we're not nice in their comments about doing portraits. Oh, you're just doing, making people look better. And I said, well, then if that's your belief, you shouldn't be a portrait artist. You know, if you feel that anything you make in the fiber world is just gonna be duplicated by China, one, you're probably right. But two, 
it's your job to promote what you do as being far different, you know, that they call it that unique identifying feature, you know, and we see that a lot in the fiber people. They maybe they're sharing their own sheep. Um, maybe they're, um, I don't know of anyone raising silkworms, so let's be blunt about oh, that. That's got a, <laughs> you know, uh, most of us are going to import something uh, like silk from China or India or something like that. And um, I can hear some grumbling going on back there. Okay, some people maybe are doing their own silkworms. <laughs> but it's a common question, by the way. Um, I, I encompass a lot of areas and I also like to have them overlap. Um, one of the examples I use is uh, felting. Now I am not a Nuno felter and I love Nuno felting. I love the results of it. I love the results somebody else did of Nuno felting. Honestly, there's a certain area if you have to pay bills with your art of a return on investment and some art forms take a tremendous amount of time um, and the and this usually women sell them for far, far less than their value. So um, I think it's important to know your pricing on your artwork, well, no matter what it is, determines the value. You, you have to place a value on yourself, what you do and how you do it. And if you grew your own silkworms, well, maybe you don't grow them, raised your own silkworms, and had particular pieces that you could just, oh, that eight by eight inch square is a thousand dollars because by the way, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry, whom I raised produced that and I spun it and I did this and I did that. Um, sometimes I'm more amazed at some of those forms of art like the uh, silkworm uh, industry and the sheep industry as to what it took you know, who came up with the idea a thousand years ago, 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, go to spin wool and silk and make it into a fabric. I think that's, I think that's amazing. I think that most of us as artists, you know, we, we, we all understand the terminology slow fiber because any kind of fiber art is definitely slow fiber. Um, oh yeah. But I think we all have those pieces that we get done with and we actually compute the amount of time we put into them and you know it's and you just you 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 don't get your value but so you do a lot of this just out of love and your passion and creativity. Um, so um, what do you do to, to stay motivated? to keep you. Oh, well, I have to honestly tell you this past year was an unusual year for everybody. Obviously the COVID influenced everything that we do, how we do it, what we're doing. But I did find it hard for the first time in my life not to be motivated. Um, and maybe it was because there weren't shows coming up. Maybe it was because- um, No deadlines. Uh, there were no deadlines. Yeah, there were no deadlines. And I found that I can just go focus, 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 focus. I am a, like a list person too. I like to make lists. I have been known to even do things on my list that weren't on my list. And I go at them just for the excitement of crossing them off, okay? It's like, wait a minute, cutting the grass wasn't on my list today, but I did it and I'm gonna put it down and I'm gonna, zip my line through it to show that I got it done. So it, it gives me a certain amount of satisfaction to do that. Now that doesn't pertain to housework. Um, so let's not go there. Luckily, kids are out of the house. And as my husband said, you know, I thought it was the kids making all the mess, but it seems <laughs> that it's just two adults living in the house, apparently. So do you work in the studio every day? I have two studios. I have a big studio, the one that I'm in now, and I guess I could kind of turn, you know, no, I'm not moving this. I'm afraid that if I move anything, you just you suddenly won't hear me or something. Um, 
this is a studio that we built. It's a 24 by, um, by 30 studio. We built it about 20 years ago, um, tore down an old building, used pieces of that to go make the floor, the whole, it's 10 foot ceilings. This was more of our art studio. Um, I have a smaller studio that I use to do the silk work and the leather work in. I've taken over our front porch of the house because a lot of times I'll work outdoors doing big pieces of um, fabric. So um, sometimes I'll go days without going into the smaller silk studio. But I also have turned one of the bedrooms into, and it's funny, once the kids are out, I told them with four of them, they're grown now. I said, if you come back, you're going to stay in a motel or you're going to sleep on the floor because I've taken we've taken over the rooms. So one of mine is an office, and but it's my sewing room as well. So those were other things that I learned as I went along. I had always sewn for my girls when they were little. I have two boys and two girls. But um, obviously later, like when it came to boys, it was easier to buy a pair of jeans. And, well, who's going to make jeans? Come on. So I discovered over the years that, um, that I was a good sewer, but as I got into uh, eco printing, painting on silk, all the different silk things that I was doing, and then going into wool and some linen, that I brought my sewing skills back. Well, I actually tried to hire some people and I found that interest, the, the whole thing was interesting. I've never had to hire people to do some work before, but I did try to see, okay, were there moms or there's somebody that wanted and yeah, there were people that wanted to do it. And this was more than you'd get piecework, okay? I mean, it was almost like 50% of what I was retailing these things for. And um, they just couldn't get motivated. If I said, okay, I need 10 of these pieces and I need it in 30, you know, 30 days, plenty of time, right? You know, halfway through, there'd be like one, one piece done. That'd be like, I was making these kimonos. And finally, I wound up doing things like buying a serger and I have to tell you right off the bat, you know, I'm not uh, people, you know, like, you know, Suzanne, Marsha Fair, she's like this extraordinary seamstress. Well, that's not me. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. No, I'm adequate. Okay. I do a good job, but I am not a seamstress. You know, I mean, the one that just it's lined and it's double lined and it's got, uh, I mean, you know, there isn't a, thing wrong with the edges or the corners or anything so I noticed you 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 emphasize stress <laughs> <laughs> you know oh well, it's well you know I had to just I had to bite the bullet I mean I was when someone tries to put up a block in your way and it could be anybody it can be circumstances it can be mm -hmm. uh, an uncooperative spouse it can be um uh your adult kids with you know somewhere along the line when you go to your little art zone that's what i call it i don't care if you're painting i don't care if you're sewing i don't care if you're out in the garden um, a lot of the eco printing and dyeing people i notice love to kind of combine everything they're combining oh let's get the seeds for indigo let's get uh seeds for this plant and that plant and that plant we'll plant the seeds we're going to harvest the seeds it's a whole caboodle. And obviously that's not a profit making industry for them, but that's not really the point in many instances. A lot of people return to the art field, I noticed um, in the marketing that I did when they retired. And it's like, and so having a reason to grow these, maybe you want to learn. It's hard to be self-motivated uh, which is why being self-employed is not for everybody. And I tell people, I said, don't ever be artists, especially that paint. I go, you don't have to make a living at your art to be creative and to feel accomplished. And, um, you know, people can be their own worst enemies. On one hand, you're an artist. So really you can be a little bit odd and nobody sees any problem with that because that's the way artists are supposed to be. Yeah, I think, you know, artists, <clears throat> people have this general idea that most artists are a little bit off the wall and a little bit crazy. Sure. Uh, and there is a big difference between artists who just do things for fun and for creativity 
Um, and then artists who actually have to support themselves and pay all their bills making their art. Um, I know that sometimes when you are just making things, you know, you'll really go and go and go and make that piece perfect. But when you're doing a piece that you have to sell and you have to, you know, do a show, something that you, you just want to do production work and work fast and, and get things done. Um, so when you're working, do you see a finished product before you start or does most of your work just evolve? A lot depends on what I'm working on. Um, as you know, the leather is kind of a newer industry. Um, actually, it's a huge industry. And so when I um, do the workshops at your place, I show a lot of the finished products. Um, I know one of them and a couple of them you'll see online. Some things I obviously don't make, you know, this for instance is, um, and I added the chain holding for it. Okay, so what you've got here is a pocket, but it's a heavier leather. And so what I did here, and the inside is also eco printed, if you can see that. So it's a double sided. So with these, I did the leather. And then I looked at the leather and I see what can I make with it? A lot of them I do make these smaller bags because they're just easier for, um, I mean, they fit the piece that I've got, you know, so I don't have any problem with these. And these are doable, these are easier to make. They are less time consuming. And even though I teach the paper eco printing, which has all sorts of things that you can do. Um, one of my YouTube, uh, uh, on my YouTube channel, one of the things I have down is um, making like earrings out of leather, or you could just substitute the leather for the paper eco printing that you do. You know, it's lightweight, they're not expensive, they don't take as much time to make as a lot of other products. The leather was something that, again, I tried to hire some leather makers. Okay, here's a finished piece of leather. Can you do this? This is what I need. And again, they couldn't get motivated. You know, never mind that they were getting paid before I even sold the piece. You know, I would have no idea yet when or, or, or whatever it was sell. So it was sort of, um, and that's when I said, oh, well, screw this. I'm tired of waiting on people. And you know what I call that? I call it being held hostage. <laughs> I don't want to be held hostage. <clears throat> My husband, bless his heart, you know. If I have to repair something around the house, I will go and repair it. I will wait for him to do it. And that's a bad habit too sometimes because they go, oh, if I don't do it, she'll do it, you know. But for the most part, when it came to hiring people, I, I found that I almost had to know everything about what I wanted made. So in both the sewing and the leather work, I wound up teaching myself a lot of, um, of the little tricks and I mean, and those are where I don't have a finished product in mind or I kind of have an idea, you know, luckily for both industries, there are patterns out there. I mean, if I want to learn how to sew something, I'll go through the instructions, you know, a simplicity pattern or something. If I want to make a dress out of something, the fabric that I've made. Um, I've also had to learn, and some of the things you learn are just tricks that you come upon because I'm looking for what I call a shortcut. It doesn't mean I'm not doing, it doesn't mean I'm skipping something or not making it as good. It means that there's gotta be an easier way to do this and come up with a beautiful product. And I think that's part of um, uh, anyone that makes something. I mean, there's only so fast you can go if you're sitting in a chair and you're gonna be knitting something, okay? Um, and someone came up with a knitting machine. Um, and that may not be the same as getting on a bus and holding your piece in your hand and, and knitting away at it. I mean, yeah. quite frankly, I think people love to watch somebody doing that. You know, there's not a fast way to shear my alpacas. There wasn't a, there was, I hand milk my uh, Nubian dairy goats, even when they got up to 20 being milked twice a day even though I did later buy milking machines, it was almost more trouble to hook everything up because <laughs> they were not so, cows. I know you make a lot of garments. How do I do. You handle, how do you handle the sizing issue? 
sizing seems to be with me in the studio the biggest issue because mm -hmm. I'll make something and it'll be one size and somebody will come in and they'll go, do you have that in a, in a, in a 3X or do you have that in an extra small? And it's like, no, this is a one of a kind piece. And the lady looks at me, she goes, well, I guess you have to be a one of a kind size too. So size oh, yeah. Yeah. is an yeah. issue. Um, I mean, you can only do so many scarves and so many um, pieces. So how do you when it comes to doing when it comes to doing pieces, I I come up with patterns and ideas. Now Ruanas were one of them because you don't have to fit anybody; they fit easily. You can make a Ruana. You can sew the sides wide enough. So I make sure that all my garments can be tried on. I don't need a dressing room if they want to pull um, a raw silk piece over their head or with. They can do it with their clothes on because many times they need clothes underneath them for the, to wear the piece. But you're right. There's only so many ways to, um, there are only so many scarves you can sell. And people are always saying, oh, I have plenty of scarves. But, and as you know, Suzanne, in the art world, the biggest thing you would hear from somebody is, I don't have any space on my walls. And my initial reaction to that after years of doing art shows was, Oh my God, just move something, buy it, move something, you know, <laughs> I've got a beyond, you know, whatever. But then I realized, and I had to learn this from somebody else that um, that was a common refrain from people, just like the sizing. They are really interested in your piece. They don't, and when they bring up an objection, which is a size, or in the case of wall art, know where to put it, then they're really interested in your job as the designer and the maker is to tell them more to interest them. And you have to think about this. Your job is to say, okay, you know, this doesn't fit her. She's obviously a size three X. This looks to be a two X. So one, you make, excuse me, clothing that can be easily tried on for these people. You know, um, the Ruanas, the loose fitting kimonos, um, uh, uh, all of those, and, and you get a feel for it after a while, even pullover type ponchos. I started doing ponchos in the raw silk and then I'd start coming across with little um, closures so they could, I made sure they would fit. I made sure that there was closures that if they were big busted, it would fit if they were small busted. And then, um, and every so often I have something that's smaller but real, most of my stuff would fit an over plus size, but yet look good, especially if it's silk or raw silk on any size person because of the drape of the product. And I think you've got to, to think, use your thinking cap. When they come up and say, do you have that in another size? They're really interested in that, that piece. And offering that objection, which we call it, for the size is telling you, all right, subtly telling you, tell me a reason I should get this, even though I'm wondering if you have it in a different size. So your job exactly. then is to be able, you see, and you can tell yeah. them, oh, this, this looks beautiful on everyone. Let me slip it on you right now, put it on right now, here's my mirror and take a look. And then they're like, oh, I guess so, you know. If they have a smart husband, he'll have the smarts to go, oh, that looks wonderful, darling. You know, I mean, if she's happy, he's happy, right? So that's what we learned, that when someone gives you an objection over something that you've got, that you've made, that's kind of, I don't know, it's one you've heard a thousand times, okay? That is their invitation to you to tell them, well, Okay, why should I have it? I've heard it referred to as the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. The angel is over here going, oh, you love this, you love this. And, this, and the devil over here is going, oh, it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit, you know? And the angel is going, but it would fit, it would fit, you know? So you got, you know, and it's hard because your first thing is like, roll your eyes at them or shove them out of your booth, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, so it's much better to look at your inventory and say, okay, what do I have that's just 
loose and casual and would look good on most women. Okay, and let me give you the first piece of advice is cover their butts. Okay, nobody wants to shit the stop at their waist. I mean, who does that unless they're on Project Runway? You know, they don't. What, you what can also divide, divide your sections up into, um, and you could tell the minute they walk in if something you have is gonna fit them or not. So what I did to avoid all of that is just come up with solutions um, you know, I started with just the plain ruanas and then I started doing, okay, let's do a little tax here. Okay, let's put, um, let's put uh, buttonholes in so they could unbutton them or button them as they needed on a windy day. So, you know, and you have to have all those little, um, what am I trying to say? Little things, you've seen those round things, a little thing in the middle that's kind of like the scarf holders, kind of like the old Boy Scout thing. Well, you can close up ruanas like that or scarves. You have to have those too. And you're not going to make them. You're going to buy them. You're going to have them sitting there in your booth so people can purchase those. Um, what do they call them? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, all the little things that make it easy for them to wear, especially mm -hmm. when they go, oh, I don't know how to tie a knot. And I, I have like one or two easy to do techniques that I always share with them. A lot of times I have a little piece of paper that shows how to tie. Um, and I always have one on display in my booth. So, so you asked me about marketing, you get way more than you I want. Know, I know, I know. Teresa is really into marketing. And, um, you know, I, I have- I need mean, to put food on my table and I, I just had to, and it was I've so watched, hard at the beginning. It was yeah, so I've hard. watched you go through all kinds of things though, because you were a portrait artist and then you were a, a silk painter, uh, and then you start, really got into the echo printing. Um, I, most of your work um, is right now, I, mostly I see on the echo printing. Um, is silk yeah, there's a lot of it there. Fiber? I was gonna share the one thing here was, um, this was an example when I tell the people, okay, this is, um, this is an echo printed piece of actually uh, linen. And then I came back in and I felt it, needle felted the bird, okay? It's not a big piece, okay. I only put one. Can you see it? No. Yeah. There. Uh. I think right. most people, I, I think people are now starting to embellish their prints with either stitching or beads or some kind of felting. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a really- And I, I don't have a piece, I don't have one here because they sold, but I will take uh, a silk scarf without the background, okay? It'll be white and I'll take a silk scarf and I will go on and um, put the eco print so it's like a serpentine, okay? And then no. what I do there is um, I'll come in and hand paint. So I went to someone on Etsy who did, um, had one of those thermograph machines and I drew, had drawn out my, I have a series called Woodland and this, this is where the painting comes in. So I did, um, had little silk screens made um, that I could just, that's why I didn't have to draw them all over each time. So I would silk screen in the different sections on my long piece of silk. And I'd make my little uh, woodland fairies hidden behind the leaves, the head poking out and that. And then I come back in and quite frankly, any, because I usually wind up, even though you can wear them, a lot of people wind up hanging them on the walls. So for those little wall spaces, you know, this wide, you could, <laughs> eight inches, I got the perfect solution. So um, you can come, you can do bird birds, even though I did the fairies, you can come in and paint, I don't know, you can even paint your own flowers on them if you chose to do that. But the point is you're combining silk painting, eco printing, um, print making, um, and you know, my, my, I'm big with the horse industry because a lot of my portraits are people and their horses and that. So I took um, those linograph things and I would carve my own blocks because what was the point of buying a stamp already made when anybody could duplicate that? So that, again, that's a selling point. And so then I would, um, uh, the only way to do that was to iron your silk on, um, I used to call it butcher paper. What is it, freezer paper? So it's flat. And then I would you go through and stamp my horse design. And I would have like three of them. So I'd alternate colors and stuff. So the point is that's taking, you know, several factors. That was a quicker way. Instead of hand doing each one of the uh, horses, 
Because the problem today is your buyers of hand painted silk are you're competing against digital uh, and sublimation art that the Chinese are just sending out in billions. And your job is to educate them, um, which is where I think spin has dropped off just a little bit here, is, um, you know, how can you, you know, people, sometimes the artists need to know what can I do to help sell my work and make them understand um, that this is hand done. It's not something that ran off a digital press. Do you and, and I think, any, oh, I'm sorry. No, go on, ask. Do you have any pieces where you've hand painted? Um, I know you were doing some hand painting on top of some of your um, silk, your echo prints, maybe a bird. I do, but I don't have any here with me. I thought about that when I was doing this. I said, people like to see it. I do have, and I'm more than happy to post some images on your um, IA Fiber group to show what it is. But, uh, uh, and there's techniques for people who feel they can't draw to come in and, and, um, and uh, use, and you can put it under your freezer paper. You know, you can hand draw or you can print out, I don't know, some image you want, a bird, let's say, and in marker, and you can slide it underneath that freezer paper and then you can kind of use a fabric pen to trace it out on top. It's slow, but if you're only gonna, you know, each one is individual, you can't duplicate these, um, even with a screen print, I get the outline on there that I want, but I still come back with textile paint, uh, fabric paint. But quite frankly, and I get, my closet is proof of this, I don't own a pair of jeans and that that doesn't have, even though my portraits are in oils and pastels, for a lot of art classes I give people, we use acrylic paint. It doesn't come off your clothes. I don't care yeah. how many times you wash it. You know, it it's doesn't. there, it's stuck. And so, you don't even, if you're not gonna be wearing it and you're not interested in a soft, perfect hand, you can get regular text, I mean, regular acrylic paints and paint your image there. And if you need, and if you go on and not get it too thin, you don't have to worry about doing um, a border around it or using a resist. Um, those are things when you go back to that question, you asked me, what do you do in your own? Well, there was no deadlines for these. I didn't have customers for them. Um, but I do prefer, just like the, the felted piece I showed you, I've got one up there with cardinals too. You can do the exact same thing by painting on, uh, and I usually will use um, either linen or raw silk because um, both you can actually needle felt on those just, just fine. Um, some of them I back, some of them I don't. I've got, I'll grab a large one here, hang on. Here is, um, oh. can you see this one? So, so one of the classes I have to do for Maryland Sheep and Wool is wool hanging, um, or wall hanging. And so I, I try to show people, you know, you just put a, um, uh, if you can see this, that's just um, bias tape back here. You put a dowel rod and you can put any sort of uh, driftwood that you want. So I came through with these after I eco printed on it. And uh, see if you can see that. And then put these little birds on here. Now this one doesn't have a backing. So, you know, you can kind of see that it's obviously, but it's designed to hang on a wall. And it's pretty long. I mean, it goes, it's, it's 45 inches, you know, and so I serge the edges and, uh, and I would tell you right now, I don't, you know, my husband and I pay our bills, all right? We live frugally, our house is paid for, our cars are paid for. So when they tell people I make a living as an artist, it's always been that way. You know, um, I have more money now that the kids aren't here anymore and they're all on their way. But I think, I mean, you know, just because they're grown doesn't mean they go away. I'm, <laughs> I love my kids, but you know, just because they're grown so, doesn't mean. But I will post some of those hand painted ones. I've got fairies and I've got some birds that I hand painted and I'll be glad to post them on your Eye of Fiber um, Facebook group just to, just to share for people who popped in this morning 
So you've done all these other things in, in, in your creative life. Is there anything else that you feel compelled to attempt or try or branch off into? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Retirement? Well, <laughs> well you, have to, you have to realize that one reason the eco printed really appealed to me, and I have to tell you, you know, when as a painter for 30 years, and part of that of me getting really into it was twofold. When the economy collapsed 2008, my big portraits, my three, four, five thousand dollar portraits, it, they went with it. They just boom, down all of a sudden. By the time the big portraits, and I've got a couple coming up in May to do, I photo shoots we, we take. By the time those started to come back, the audience had begun to change. And now you're dealing with a lot of younger moms and portraits are not in their vocabulary. You know, um, um, I have one dog portrait I grabbed off the wall. And so, you know, Corgi, this is a pastel. And I do very realistic portraits of children and, um, and adult, everybody actually. And so I'm a little unusual in that respect because some artists just love to do animals, some love to do just people and not, not a whole lot of us do both. Well, then the internet started to really pop in. Everything's changed. I mean, you can take a photo and have an app on your phone that says, make it look like a watercolor, bing, bing, bing. And even though it doesn't really look like a watercolor, people aren't educated enough to know the difference. And Again, that would be a case of having to um, share with people that what you do is the real thing. But, you know, the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that, you know, you do what you want to do. Um, in a portrait from A to Z, the steps, I know exactly what I'm doing. In the eco printing, you don't know. And I used to honestly think that the people that did the pottery, okay, they were nuts too, by the way, in college. But I used to think that the pottery people, why would you put a brown glaze on something and hope it turned red? But why would anyone do that, you know? To me, it was hard to do art and not know what the outcome was gonna be. And the beauty about the eco printing and sometimes even the silk painting, uh, there are a lot of serendipitous type events in it. So you didn't know. And so when you unwrapped a bundle, it didn't matter if it was silk or leather or what, it was, it's always a surprise. And are we on here? Yep. Okay, there we go. All of a sudden my thing went off. It's always a surprise. And that's what I love. That's probably why as the industry and painting went down a little, I began to do more of it. And even though I can do what I call production work, meaning, you know, four scarves at a time or whatever, I do have that down pat for a show com shows coming up. But when it comes to things, you know, like the felting on it, um, uh, I found one or two times I would have friends come over rather recently and say, hey, help me do some of these big pieces because you know, I'll work on big yardage and we can cut them up to make some smaller wall hangings. I'll give you a couple pieces. You can felt your own, but help me with the big pieces. And sometimes that works really well. Just you bring a friend over and I have to, I have to tell you this, but a lot of times if I'm at a show, um, my husband will be there and he'll be manning the booth if I have to teach something or if I'm just uh, off taking a break. And, and he purposely, he purposely will say, because people always come up to you in a booth and they'll want to know, um, how, did you do uh, how did she do that? How did she do that? You know, and, the, and he just says, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm just here. <laughs> Give people back. And um, if you're going to talk about marketing, I will address that real quickly. You're always going to have people who don't want to buy your workshops. They don't want to buy your products, but they want to know how you do something. Now, when it came to um, the portraits, my solution there was to make a CD that I could just 
Okay, here you go. You could buy the CD. If they're at a show, it'd be 20 bucks. Here's a CD on the ebook because I did a lot of marketing through Jerry's Artorama and um, I did uh, a lot of audios for them, uh, DVDs in the day of um, how to do this, how to do a lot of how to DVDs. And, um, and, and that stopped them dead because otherwise you're paying for this booth, right? I don't care what show you're at. They come in, they're hovering over you, they won't go away. And so I found that if I just had, in, with a case of art, this will tell you everything you need to know. I hold it up, 20 bucks. And then I also had to learn, and I, do you wanna know something? Out of a hundred people that would ask me, how do you make a living out of art? I do this, I'd love to do this. Out of a hundred people, I bet eight bought it. <laughs> the rest were like, okay, if my advice wasn't worth 20 bucks, you know, I mean, it wasn't even like they brought me a cup of coffee and said share, right? So when you're sitting there in booths where you're doing your fiber art and your silk work and, and gosh, all the stuff that you've done, then uh, two things, get, get your relatives out of the booth because the booths are all coming back. All the shows are starting to pick back up and we're, we're coming now. They may be scattered, but the other. And the other thing is to always have somebody else with you and just step outside the booth and say, you know, have an answer. I've got a class coming up, workshop, whatever. And um, I learned that if I just said, let me have your phone, your um, name and your email or here, put it down here on this sheet of paper. And I'll let you know when my next workshop on this very thing is coming up. <laughs> So and then I, with that in mind, with talking about classes coming up, maybe yes. we'll talk about your class coming up at the studio in May. Yeah, now that's going to be the leather and it's going to be the paper. And one of the biggest things I learned with the, um, uh, and a lot of people that took the workshop and were interested in bookmaking. And I will share, by the way, different things to make other than the books. Excuse me while I parch myself. But um, the advantage of the leather was twofold. Uh, I don't know how many of you make handmade books of any nature at all, but they're time consuming. They take a lot of time. They are labors of love. It's really difficult to even begin to get your money back from the time. Let's just come out right now and say, you're not going to, but you want to make it and you you know some people love tying the ends the knots making the signatures putting them together so when we do the paper we go through okay make the signature covers for each of your signatures with your eco printed paper that's that you're not going to find that in amazon crappy chinese books okay so that was one thing that we went through the other thing was the covers are leather okay price determines value if you tell someone it's one reason i don't eco print on cotton all right, cotton conveys what? T-shirts. I mean, just face it, T-shirts, you know, stretchy fabric, something or other. It doesn't convey the same thing in people's mind that silk, wool, and leather does. You know, if you say, oh, the upholstery in my car is leather, people are like, oh yeah, that's really great stuff. You know, never mind that I don't like leather seats in a car because my butt slides all over them. You know, in my house, I can't sit in the one chair that someone gave to us because I slide down. I mean, I hate them, but people think it's leather. So um, one of the biggest things is how much money you can waste finding the wrong leather. So I really do get into that, um, bring lots of samples down. Susanna had asked, well, you can always ship this stuff. And I go, oh no, no, you know, I go down there. Thank God she's got, you know, all the, uh, cooking pots and stuff like that. Uh, otherwise I'd have to take the van. But no, by the time I bring rolled up leather hides, by the time I bring everything that I need, but it makes it so that you in your area, no matter what part of the world you live in, can go out and, and successfully purchase your own leather from a supplier without being um, spending hundreds of dollars and it'd be wrong. You know, they don't let you do returns very well. They may let you do exchanges. So that makes a big, big difference. And you don't, certainly don't want to pay for shipping and then turn around and have to ship something heavy back. But yeah, so that's one of the biggest things when I do your workshop, let alone the fact that it's in a to die for location. 
you know. And by the way, when you do stuff like, you know, my husband comes with me and it's, it's our vacation, okay? You know, and I put him to work too. He's, he's real good. He's an artist too, by the way. Maybe I should point that out. You know, he's a painting artist and he's a gold leaf painter as well, hand, less of the hand letterers. So he stays in constant demand. So between the two of us, and we're working all the time in the field of art. And uh, now he does nothing with the leather. Um, um, he, you know, uh, he loves to be ignorant about some things, you know, don't, don't ever play him in Trivial Pursuit because he's got one of those IQs that just really is annoying. But um, uh, when it comes to supporting each other as artists, uh, that's what we do. And I think that's, um, that's a huge advantage. It's something a lot of artists don't have. They don't have the support system that we give each other back and forth. So I do spend a lot of time in a workshop too, oftentimes. And, um, and by now you've kind of gotten my sense of humor. I am irreverent. Um, uh, I do kind of shoot from the hip. A spade is a spade. And I have told a couple of women whose husbands give them a hard time. I said, give me his phone number. I'll call him. We need to set him straight. <laughs> so you know, so I posted a few pictures of some stuff. Um, so of some, some stuff. Oh, the students have done do yeah, yeah. and um, and everything um, I will send you the ones where you paint on the silk and uh, uh, the different ones too they're kind of fun to do it's something uh, they take time but it's one thing I have noticed the ego printers the silk painters I know the felters the um, stitchers they all tend to be in their own little niche category um, uh, the natural dyers are over here and this little thing, the, the um, indigo people are right over here. You know, they don't, they don't mix and they don't, which is where I think being an artist, you can't be afraid to try something. You know, I try lots of things. It's not because I'm going to sell the item. It's just that, well, let me see how it's going to work. And if I then like it, then my mind goes into, how can I do this and make it affordable, um, make me money and make it affordable to my client? And um, yeah, and the so, books, yeah, the books, that's the most popular thing when people want to do the leather class. Before, I think, we, you know. be, before we sign off, I want to ask if anybody has any questions for Teresa. And if you have one, just unmute yourself and, and shout it out there. I feel like I've rambled on and jumped maybe from one subject to the other. That's easy to do. It is. It's it. It is. I don't think I'm much different than everybody else. If, if you, oh, I hear somebody. Yeah, Teresa, can you talk a little bit about the pieces that are behind you on the wall? Yeah, hang on. Let me get you back. I've just lost something. Uh, Hang on a second. Okay, you can see me, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yes. then let's, oh, okay, all of a sudden Susan can. Okay, I've got, um, well, do you want me to just grab something? Yeah. Uh, this is just a base, this particular piece is a basic um, eco-printed silk scarf. And I will tell you, uh, when I first got started getting into it, probably about 12 years ago, and it's kind of interesting, in the original beginning of eco printing, everyone was happy just to get a print. Like, oh, so, and now it's kind of turned into where, um, and the public is a little more aware of it, but it's hard. Color is your wow factor, okay? Color is your wow factor. So there's so many things that you can do in the eco printing, and it's usually with a dyed blanket for color. Um, however, let me show you. Um, okay, this piece. All right, it's pretty cool, isn't it? All right, this is rayon and it's ice dyeing. All right, here's a little thing. You know, you buy these from Dharma. They have a nice tutorial on ice dyeing. This is a great one, by the way, if you bring friends over. 
this is also a great way to have some pieces for show because honestly, what is easier than to wrap this thing in a wad, put it on a rack outdoors. Let's see, what do we do? Um, put your ice all over it. And again, this was rayon. Uh, I use fiber reactive dye on this and you just sprinkle the dye on top. And then you let it sit overnight, 24 hours, and you come out with whatever it was you were sprinkling on. It's total serendipitous. There's nothing that you have to do. Um, there's no thinking you have to do except for the steps. But if you're getting ready to go to a show or something like that, and you know, you know, Dharma sells all these rayon, uh, I think they sell rayon garments and stuff too, you know. So um, uh, I, except for these, I stay away from non <coughs> because it's just not what I show in my booth. But, you know, it's silk and wool and stuff like that, or what I call the protein fibers, which is what I prefer to work on. Uh, anything in particular? You've seen some of the pocketbooks. Um, is it going to be too the weather or is it going to just, is it going to be both because I don't want to do turquoise that. one behind your head. It's a turquoise. The, this? Oh, the turquoise one that looks like well, a, it's no, a purple pinky small chunk. Other side. With there the peacock you go. feathers. Keep Over. going. Nope. Next. 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 No, keep to going your to the, left. Keep going. No, keep going. Oh, here? Yes. Oh. This is hand painted. This is using a gold oh. resist. And I draw the um it's I got a peacock on either end. Yeah. So, so, so I have two in the middle here. And then um I use a gold resist to draw it out. And then I come back in and I use um, stretcher bars. I use artist stretcher bars to put a frame together. And then I use, um, I have little eye hooks in them. Didn't occur to me. That's all down in the silk studio. Didn't yeah. occur to me. So I have that one. Some of them. Oops. Okay, here's another one doing the lotus flowers. So some of these are easy to draw. And a lot of times, um, and some people say, oh, you're an artist, so you don't have any trouble drawing these and you just run right through. But the point is you can get a piece of paper. And draw around it. Yeah, you know, these are, if they're, even if they're on stretcher bars or if you put them on freezer paper, just get a piece of paper, use a marker to draw whatever it is you want. Print something out from your computer, find some clip art that you like. And then you can slide this underneath a blank silk scarf. Um, even if it's, I use, um, and to transfer these sometimes, I tell people, <clears throat> just go to a window. I have kids do this all the time. And um, go to a window with your pattern from the computer hold a piece of paper on, trace it with your um, marker, Sharpie pen, whatever it is. And I keep those in a stack. I have like different birds that I like in that. Um, if there's one thing that, that I despise about parents and kids and art is that if I show kids how to copy something, it's kind of like the first step, even the old masters. I mean, I don't, but even the old masters, you learn by copying. And it used to be many years ago, before everyone started ripping off the Mona Lisa and stuff, you could take an easel and stuff into um, museum galleries, art galleries, and sit in front of a piece and paint it <coughs> to learn, you know, seeing real. Because obviously when it's printed off, it's not exactly, um, the colors aren't the same. We all know two green, two blue, something like that. And so I show kids how to do it. And the first thing out of a parent's mouth is, oh, well, that's cheating. And I'm like, oh God give me strength, you know? Um, there's nothing I can't look at and draw, okay? That's, a, that's an ability I've always had since I was little. And, um, and I don't think about it, I just do it. But not everyone can do that. Their, their skills lay somewhere else. So I help kids out. And um, so nothing annoys me more than a parent that'll come up and say something like that. And I go, well, you know what? Are you using a computer? I mean, that means you're not using your brain. Are you using a calculator? You're cheating. So I just, 
And that, by the way, happens to be how I, I, I think. Uh, again, I may be direct, too direct for some people, but you know, I can't stand somebody judging somebody else. Um, you know, I get painting groups and there'll be six or seven women from an office and I give them templates to work from when they're gonna, cause they got two hours to paint, you know, they don't wanna learn how to draw. They just wanna paint the picture, but that's it. And there's always somebody in the office who says, oh, I'm not going to come I, that's cheating. I'm going to, I'm going to just draw it. And oh my God, two hours. I listened to the one lady who was gonna draw it, wine. <laughs> Cause it doesn't look like everyone else's. And I said, well, none of them are gonna look the same <laughs> regardless. So, you know, don't hesitate. Uh, now the peacock is kind of big, but for the most part, once you've done one or something, um, you just go on and do it. And it doesn't matter if there's some little overlaps here. I know the silk painter groups and that, they get really, they're looking for perfection. Well, what dyes are, what, what dyes are you using for silk painting? Um, I started using the Chicard green label dyes and I do have this, hang on. I use die set. Okay, die set, in other words, I don't steam this. Do you think I'm gonna pay $3,000 for a steamer? Do you wanna see my steamer? <laughs> This is my steamer. Can you see this? It's a Goodwill rice cooker. All right. It's kind of like the biggest they have. Let me make sure there's no water in it. And I'll roll my stuff up. On, but even that's time consuming. And sometimes these things stick together. So with a die set, you use one cap and a gallon of cold water. Now, I've used the Jacquard green label dyes. If I don't do anything with them, they're going to come off. They're going to, you know, they get wet and they're going to run. So I take these just like this. I've just painted it, let's say, and I drop it into the thing. The die set and I stir it around. They say 30 seconds. I think I do it for a minute. I figure 30 seconds, 40, a minute's better. And um, so I do that and uh, bring them out, rinse them off, let them dry and by God, and it's there, it's permanent, you know. And you know, Dharma says things like, oh, it's going to get, um, you're gonna lose some color. Well, I don't think I've lost any color on this. You know, my customers no, that, are happy. That's very vibrant. I, I my, consider myself to be a hybrid dyer. I use both, you know, yeah. some, uh, dyes, especially for silk painting, you need acid dyes and, and dyes. Um, I use the acid dyes for- um, Dyes also. Yeah, I use the acid dyes for almost, everything from the eco printing dye blankets and that. Uh, one reason is because I've seen that, I've seen, I, I love the natural dyes. I love the concept of the natural dyes, but they do fade. And um, I don't know how those Iranian rugs from 2000 years ago on Antique Roadshow are still kind of, but maybe they're not as vibrant as they used to be. Now, I'm, you know, are we gonna care 2000 years from now if, if our scarf is still vibrant? No, however, um, uh, I can't sell something to have it come back to me a year later and the log one went from purple to brown. And I know that upsets natural dyers if you mention it, but I think it should be. I mean, natural dye is a labor of love. There's no getting around it. It's it's a beautiful, I mean, who wouldn't want to plant marigolds and see if you can come up with something and, and the different, um, uh, I even have some Hopi black dye sunflower seeds, which I didn't discover was my freaking, um, bird seed, sunflower, <laughs> black oil. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, let's see what that does. Just, just to do it. You know I mean? Who doesn't want to try making walnut dye or something um, for ink? I have found that I have resurrected many a ugly echo print by folding it and clamping it with shibori and then yes. over dyeing with black dye and then I get these beautiful little windows of echo print inside. Um, yeah. And it's, I have, and believe it or not, those people love them. It's, it's combining different techniques um, over top and usually the black dye, which isn't always black dye. Um, it can be a combination of colors will hide your previous echo prints or you'll get a very faint, faint shadow behind them. 
Well, it's... I'll tell you the first thing you learn about anything that you create is that you are your own worst enemy. Uh, I see it on the boards all the time. I just want to shake some of those people. They're when they're going, what is wrong with this? Why is this? And I'm thinking, what is wrong with it? I think it looks great. What's the problem? You know, so it, it bothers me more that someone's looking for perfection in an art form where perfection isn't going to happen. It's going to be serendipitous. Uh, combining shibori, that didn't even occur to me, quite frankly. And I think that's an excellent idea. You know, there's things that I haven't liked and my customers have loved. Yeah, that always happens. You know, you'll get a piece and you get it done and you go, eh. and then you, you put it out and the next person that walks in goes, oh my God, that's beautiful. Um, oh, you know, that's when you just learn to shut your mouth. Don't say it. Isn't word. it beautiful? Um, so we, she says, oh my God, you know, it's, it's gorgeous. So, you know, we, take you know, and the people, the other thing, you see it in painting all the time, but in art form, I've seen people open them, um, talk about, look, this has been hanging in my, in my office or my studio for two years now, and they did do something different with it, you know, go in and paint on top, of the, you know, and you've got nothing to lose. It's just hanging there anyway. You know, maybe it didn't sell the last few shows you were at. Um, do something different, felt on it. Uh, you know, squunch it up and ice dye on top of it. You know, there's so much you can do with what you've got. And that to me is where the creative part, and you can tell I get excited when I'm talking about it. Cause then, you know, when I leave, like when we end here today, I'm like, okay, I'm inspired. I'm, I'm inspired. There's a couple of things I want to try now, which when I first got up this morning, were not on my list. I will tell you that <laughs> I'd be like, okay, it's been raining. I cut the grass. I'm going to get another cup of coffee. Um, now I'm like, no, 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 no. I think now that I've talked about it, I'm going to go try this or try that. And I would hope everyone would be thinking, okay, what are those pieces I really don't like? And so I don't mind people uh, contacting me and saying, you know, how did you do this or that? But I'll post it on the um, iFiber Facebook group. Um, I'll see I if see I can Sarah, find it. Sarah has her hand raised. Oh, okay. Sorry. So Sarah, do you have a question? Um, yeah, sorry, I don't want to show myself. I have a little laryngitis, but um, I, your class, is it just going to be on leather or is it going to be on paper, fabric and leather combination? It's on the, the, the one at Suzanne's will be on leather and paper. And okay. the paper is a big industry. Um, uh, right. Paper is small and you only need a small workspace to do it in. Okay. And, Hold on, let me finish. Yes. The, let me finish the question. So, oh, oh, okay. I've already done some echo dyeing, and I'm very interested in just doing the leather. And I have done a little leather with another teacher, and I have a designer who wants me to do some. I showed her a little sample, but it wasn't really. It was just a small. I had, and the teacher before said, "Well, you're gonna, you may not achieve what you're looking for." So I have different some some stuff like buffalo hides, you know, and I wonder. You know, is this first worth for me to go into this with this designer? You know, if the results don't come out, you know, I'm like, well, I don't know. But, you know, do you have you experience with different leathers and then the chemical? She said we're very toxic if I was to use them on the buffalo. So what's your what's your. Um, you OK, know, let me let me just tell you. OK, part of what I do when I teach the leather. OK, this is leather. Right. All right. Yeah, this no is leather. All right. Leather. Right. It's, These are yeah. leather pieces. All right. But I do some large pieces of leather too. Uh, I have found, uh, I've, I've spent years in the leather industry that had nothing to do with eco printing and that. So um, one of the things that I learned over a period of time is a little bit more leather here. And it is on both sides. One of the things I learned was that um, there's a lot of misinformation out there when it comes to eco printing. Uh, you can't, uh, I, I probably have the bank account. I can show you the money that I wasted on selecting the wrong leathers. And that's probably, if you learn nothing else from workshop with me, you will learn what to do and what to find. Um, some of the things like leather is already tanned. All right, there's no need to stretch it after, there's no need. There's no need to do that unless you've over-processed it or something. So uh, 
I think a lot depends on what size piece your leather is not, ecoprenion leather is not suited to um, upholster your car seat in, okay? Um, that's probably the biggest thing to, to share with you. So if you've got a designer that's looking for, I don't, what are they looking for? Are they looking for, you know, if someone comes to me and says, okay, I want uh, your pocketbooks and I can say, okay, these are what I have available, you know? Um, uh, here's a here's a book cover I've got that um, I'm gonna I insert. I teach people how to do these little ones. They're not they're not hard to do, but um, I think a lot depends on what your designer is looking for. It's one thing they need to understand are the, the people that that want you to do something is that this isn't coming from China, so each piece yeah. is going to be individual. I think that's probably the well, well I heard that thing. you are good. You are specialized. Like she actually recommend, well, she didn't recommend, but then I did my own research and she said, well, you know, it sounds like you are best on knowing how to dye leather. And from what I see, you know, as teacher, so that's a compliment to you. And I, you. I was like, I told the designer, well, listen, I can't tell you what the product is that she wants, but it, the pieces would be like, you know, 24 inches by 24 inches and you know and those are might... doable yeah, yeah. Th those are certainly doable i think a lot depends on um on your dedication once you discover the leather that works for you and um again this is where i go you know and i spend a lot of time with people on this and i think some people just it, it maybe glazes over their eyes but the first time they need to buy leather i have you want this you don't want that oh. this will work this will not work and, you know, her and buffalo, her buffalo hides may not work, right? Because she wants buffalo hide. Uh, it may not work. However, um, if I were you, I would say, give me samples of your buffalo hide, you know? And yeah, you yeah, I have bring... samples. Huh? I have samples of the buffalo hide, and I, I could yeah. bring them to class first and, and experiment, Well, right? I would tell people, now I've had other people want to bring and sometimes part of my workshop too, I show you the results of the leather that doesn't work. Right. Okay. And when I show you those results, you'll know why I also share that this could be armor. This could be armor. This could, this could kill you, this piece of hard leather. So, mm -hmm. and I'll be funny about that. If you shop, I would tell you, bring that leather. Let's see what happens, you know? I'm gonna I'm gonna insist that you use the leather that I bring, right? And then at the same token, we're gonna experiment on your leather, and I'll show you why. And even if I know right off it's not gonna work, I'll I'll show you. You'll see why. And nothing right. works better with someone like that than to say this is why your buffalo particular buffalo leather won't work. All so right. So Sherry has her hand raised too. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sherry, do you have a question? Yes, actually, it was also related to leather. Could you highlight some of the differences in working on leather, which is an animal fiber versus a, a product rather than other animal products like wool and silk? I treat it as a protein fiber. A pro protein, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And again, in workshops, I just I, I sh share all of that. I also, I'll work with thinner leather. I'll work with heavier leather. It's the heavier leather that you can come in and, you know, have, be able to work both sides, you know, the inside and, and the outside. I show you the tools that you can use. You're gonna have to learn something about working, you know, with the heavier leathers. I use a kid skin and I sell the kid skin and I bring the kid skin, but I use a kid skin, which can be used on your home sewing machine with a walking foot and a leather needle, because obviously some people don't wanna but um, you need to, you, you'll have to learn to learn something with about hand tools. And of course, the thing about a workshop is there's two things that happen. Um, one, you decide this is amazing. I want to keep doing this. I've got enough to go off on my own and continue doing this. The other thing that happens is you decide it's not for you. You go, oh no, wait a minute. That was way harder than I thought it was going to be. And, um, and only you can determine that. Um, it is probably much easier to screw up a piece of leather. Well, there's no probably about it. It is easier to screw up a piece of leather than it is 
silk or wool, you know, at least you can reuse those in some capacity. But the leather, you know, there's no do over in some le in many leathers. So once you've messed it up, you've messed it up. And that's not to scare you. It's just to say, okay, if you don't get the results the first time, let's say you're experimenting on your own, then you're gonna have to try again. Um, you know, one of the questions Suzanne asked was, okay, what is the advice? And it's not always about talent. It's not, it's about perseverance, determination, and sticking with it. Uh, gosh, I've had lots of failures, you know, and sometimes you, sometimes you have to just get mad and say, okay, that's it, I've had enough of that. And which is kind of interesting because sometimes when that happens and you just don't even care anymore, it turns out <laughs> because everything that was holding you back is gone now. And you realize, okay, I just had to be a little bit bolder in how I did something. So, um, so yes, the leather is something I've dealt with for many, many years. And I thought I knew everything there was about leather. And it, again, I, I had to have an eye opening um, epiphany about some areas of it. Uh, so, I, cause I've been in the horse world for years, for many years. And I think, I think it's important to know what you want to do with leather. And I think that would be a major determining factor. Can you make shoes out of it? Yes, you can. You know, do I need, um, I've got some pieces. Let's see if I can find them. Hang on. This is a hand stitched one that I did. And this particular one is not eco printed on the inside. This is, so I've used a combination of different leathers and eco printed leather to create this one particular pocketbook. So, and yeah, this is all hand stitched. So that was another thing where I thought, Boy, you could starve hand stitching this stuff, you know. Um, but it was satisfying to get it done. And it knows that, you know, each time I do one, I go faster and I go faster. And I think that's the other thing people uh, learn over a period of time. Once you learn a technique, then you have to exp um, experiment with it. And even in my workshops, I'll work you through the very first one. Okay. And you have a little guide sheet next to you. And then I sort of step back and say, okay, do the second piece. And then I watch because I want you to think, as long as I'm telling you what to do, you're gonna do it and it'll be right. But if I step back and go, okay, and I do have the guide sheet that you can just refer to and say, okay, step one, she said to okay. roll this, okay, step two. So and what I, I call posted. I see another question from Debbie. Okay. Debbie? Ask away. Mika, please. She has to unmute. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, we can hear you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I appreciate both of you for um, doing this. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Can you give us information about the North Georgia show and the Palm Beach show? Uh, Suzanne, I don't know anything about that. The, um, the Blue Ridge Arts Festival up in Blue Ridge, they have the Fall Festival in Blue Ridge, North Carolina, uh, Blue Ridge, Georgia. Oh, okay. And then the Palm Beach show that Amy Nugent is in next year is the Palm Beach Fine Arts, um, Fine Art Festival. It's, they have it every year. They didn't have it this year. Okay. All righty. That sounds good. I'm going to look it up because I'd love to go to see Amy and see her work. Yeah, I'm very excited for it because usually she's either at the Smithsonian or one of those big, you know, the AAC shows. Wonderful. Well, Thank you. 34, and I actually have to meet somebody in my studio at 1130 and try to get some work done for a show that I have at the end of the month. Um, so I'm on a deadline. So um, 
with that, I'm gonna, if nobody else has any questions, I'm gonna um, end today's um, session. And hopefully um, if you're interested in Teresa's class, sign up online on the website. I put it in the chat. And um, next week, um, join us. We actually have Irit Gullman coming from Israel next week. So if you're interested in that, pre-register on Eventbrite. And um, with that, everybody have a fantastic Sunday. Bye. Thank you for inviting me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.